Hi hey everyone, it's just about 20 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome back, or welcome to Coffee Shop Astrophysics. Oh, we got Cool, the slide's done. Alright, so we are Coffee Shop Astrophysics. We are all graduate students at the Leonard E. Parker Center for Gravitation, Cosmology, and Astrophysics at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Also at UWM is the Ant for Olson Planetarium. They have lots of events, most of which are over for the semester, but you can always check them out at uwm.edu slash planetarium. If you have an idea for a future coffee shop talk, feel free to come up to us after the talk, or you can send us an email at coffeeshopastrophysics at gmail.com. We also want to plug that we have a YouTube channel. We're trying a new recording method today, so we'll see if it works. Um, and for future talk announcements, you can uh, follow us at facebook.com slash coffeeshopastrophysics. Today your speakers are myself, Roman Humphrey, after me will be Ali Spaulding, and then Lulu Agassi. Our talk today is on how do we see a black hole. So we're going to go over four methods. The first is put it near a star, the second is put it near gas, the third is put things behind it, and the fourth is detect space-time ripples. So first I think it's necessary to go over what a black hole is. The most common definition you'll see is that it's a region of space with such immense gravity that nothing, not even light, can escape from it. This was first described by uh, the English clergyman John Mitchell in 1783. He writes, if there should really exist in nature any bodies whose density is not less than that of the sun and whose diameters are more than 500 times the diameter of the sun, that the light could not arrive at us, we would have no information from sight. So basically, he's proposing that if there's an object heavy enough that light can't reach escape velocity, we'll never be able to see it. He also writes, yet if any other luminous body should happen to revolve around them, uh, we might infer the existence of the central ones from their motion. So we can find these dark objects by using the motion of nearby bright objects. Come up later. So I mentioned escape velocity. This may be a review. But as you know, on Earth, if you throw a ball up, it usually comes back down. But of course, we're able to launch rockets and satellites into space. And the way we do that is by launching them at, uh, at or exceeding the escape velocity of the Earth so that when it goes out, it is going fast enough that it won't be pulled back into Earth's gravitational field. So that's John Mitchell's idea of a dark star or a black hole. But this uh, formalism is based off of a crepuscular theory of light, which says that light behaves as small particles. So for John Mitchell's understanding, which is very common at the time, this is what, how Newton understood light as well, you have a particle leaving some object, but if it's not going fast enough, it's going to get pulled right back down. It'll never reach us here on Earth, so we'll never be able to see it. But in the next couple centuries, it became apparent to scientists that light behaves more like a wave. It does sometimes behave as a particle, but for today's talk, it'll behave as a wave. And even more damning, special relativity in 1905 showed that light moves through space at a constant speed. So regardless of the local gravity, light is traveling at the speed of light. So with that idea, the light will just arrive at us at some travel time, but it should always get to us. But then 10 years later, Einstein's general relativity uh, gave us some new physics. So general relativity is usually described as space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. So we'll go over these in reverse order. If you imagine the universe as a sheet, of course we know our universe has three spatial dimensions, but for illustrative purposes, we're going to just do 2D. If you put something very heavy in the middle of that sheet, say a steel ball, it's going to deform and make a divot. So uh, that is matter telling space-time how to curve. So if we have something like the Earth here in our two-dimensional space-time, it's going to make a little divot. And then for uh, space-time tells matter how to move, if we introduce, say, a ping-pong ball into our system of a sheet and a steel ball, the ping-pong ball isn't going to make as strong a divot, but it will fall into the divot of the steel ball. So that's how we get things like orbits. So uh, general relativity is described by the Einstein field equations, which are written here in a very compact form. Uh, this is quite deceptive, because this makes it look very simple. But if we look at just this first term, just this capital G subscript mu nu, it actually looks like this. But this is also in a compact form. All of these uh, superscripts and subscripts 
really mean that we have to sum over some things. We have to add a bunch of things together. So in summation notation, that looks like, like this, where all of these big capital Greek letters, these sigmas, mean that we need to add things together. So if we look at the first one, we need to add alpha from 0 to 3, so four different alphas, beta from 0 to 3, so four different betas, 4 times 4 is 16. So just that first term looks like this. So it's a really nasty set of equations, and I promise I'll never show them to you again. But I wanted to illustrate them because uh, Carl Schwarzschild was able to solve these field equations for a few systems, and he found a singularity at the Schwarzschild radius, which will be very significant for us. So to define some words, we'll start easy with radius. We take some point, and we want to describe a distance away from it in three dimensions. It's really easy to take distance. We'll call it r for clear reasons. And if we want to take that distance in every direction, we'll spin it around so it points everywhere. In three dimensions, this would be a sphere. In two dimensions, this is a circle. And this gives us a radius. So everywhere on this red line, will be at a radius r away from that point. Okay. So the other word I want to define is singularity. This means that some of the terms in that solution became infinite. So you were likely told in elementary school that you're not allowed to divide by 0, because it would be a singularity. So one of the terms in Schwarzschild's uh, solution looks like this. This is not the whole solution, just, just a little piece of it. So this r in the bottom is a radius away from, in our case, a black hole. So at r equals 0, at 0 distance away from the black hole, so not the black hole, we get rs over 0, so that's one singularity. But we also get another one at a source shell radius, so one rs away from the black hole. So this initially looks fine. Of course, rs over rs would be like 2 over 2. That is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, and we get 1 over 0. There's another singularity there. This second singularity is very special. Um, it is what's called a coordinate singularity, which means you can do some fancy math tricks to kind of get rid of it, but the first singularity at r equals 0 is always going to be there. So it took scientists a little bit to figure out what this second singularity means, what the Schwarzschild radius means. Robert Oppenheimer, better known for other works, in 1939 uh, described it as um, a boundary of a region where time stops, which kind of works for an outside observer. If we're looking at a system like this, right at that Schwarzschild radius, we won't see anything happening within it. So it kind of looks like time stops, but that doesn't really work for an infalling observer. Uh, so it was better characterized by David Finkelstein in 1958. He argued that the singularity represented an event horizon, and if you're into classic horror movies, that very sounds similar. Um, he describes it as a perfect unidirectional membrane. Causal influences can only cross it in one direction. So basically, stuff goes in and it can't come out. So that gives us our picture of a black hole in general relativity. So again, this is in two dimensions. Our space is in three, but this is easier to draw. So we have kind of the real singularity at the bottom there. So that's the actual black hole. And then we have uh, an event horizon up top, which is at the Schwarzschild radius. So that's, once light crosses that, it's never coming out. You can kind of see why. So I said light travels at the speed of light always. So it's going to fall, go straight into that, fall in, and though it's traveling at the speed of light, it's not going to make it out. And that gives us our definition of the black hole that I said earlier, a region of space with such immense gravity that nothing, not even light, can escape from it. So I want to do a little sidestep uh, and look at how we name black holes. Uh, Scientists are really bad at naming things, especially physicists and astrophysicists. Um, so the first one was Dr. Sorry, to what John Mitchell called it. And then uh, in this kind of general relativistic scheme, uh, scientists were calling it a gravitationally collapsed object, sometimes a collapsar. Um, but these are both a little bit annoying. Uh, so in the early 1960s, uh, it started being called a black hole. Physicist Robert, Robert Dickey um, compared uh, these objects to the black hole of Calcutta, which is a prison famous for people going in and never coming out. It illustrates well. Um, then it was used in print in some pop science articles in 1963 and 1964. And then it seemed to settle into popularity in 1967 
um, and a student suggested it in a lecture uh, by physicist John Wheeler, and it just kind of stuck from there. It has good advertising value, it's easy to say. I think this is one of the few well-named objects in astrophysics. Okay, so there's several different types of black holes. First one I'll go over is stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that are several times the mass of our sun, maybe 10 times, maybe 20. Um, and these are created when a massive star collapses. So we take a really, really, really big star. As it dies, it's going to expand, it's going to collapse back down, and then it's going to explode. And after that explosion, we're left with some sort of collapsed object. And it'll either be a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, the other kind of black hole I want to go over are supermassive black holes. These are millions to billions times the mass of our sun. So these are incomprehensibly large. Uh, we don't actually know how they're formed. There are some theories, none are very concrete. Um, we do know that uh, these are found at the center of many galaxies, including our own Milky Way. So it's a bit hard to see, but uh, this is an Argus picture of the Milky Way, which is the galaxy we live in. We're out at about this point here, and then at the center is Sagittarius A star, which is our local supermassive black hole. So there's a pretty big gap between the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. 20 and a billion are very different numbers. Uh, and we don't know why this gap is here. So we're in the process of looking for intermediate mass black holes. We don't know if they're real, we don't know if they're not. If you find one, please let us know. All right, so I've talked a lot about black holes and why we can't see them, but the talk is how do we see black holes? So I think it's important to go over what we can see. And we can see light. So the humans can only see this little part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is light, uh, which is the visible spectrum. So these are all the colors that we see. But we have uh, telescopes and radio dishes and lots of things that can detect light all along this spectrum. And we characterize light by its wavelength. I said it behaves like a wave. This is kind of what it looks like. So a very, uh, well, wavelength first is uh, the distance between peak to peak or trough to trough. So uh, things like x-rays have very short wavelengths. Things like radio waves have very long wavelengths. And that's how we characterize light. So with that in mind, what does a black hole look like? So it's a bit hard to see. Okay. Does that help? No. The projector's a bit dark. Let me try it. Let me try it. Wow, that works so much better. So I didn't do anything to change the black hole. It was always there. It always looked like that. But I put a white square behind it. So that's really going to be the whole of the talk. Is uh, directly. First black hole. Uh, in time mass X-ray source, so a very short wavelength, that was first detected in 1960. The Earth's atmosphere is completely, not completely, is mostly opaque to X-rays, so we don't get a lot of them down here. But in the 60s, we started sending a lot of things to space, and we started seeing these very bright X-ray sources. So Cygnus X-1 was studied a lot to this day. Um, and it's included various methods that it's a blue supergiant star, so a really gigantic, really hot star, and a dark compact object with uh, 22.1 solar masses. This means it's 22.1 times the mass of our sun. This little circle with a dot in it is an old alchemical symbol that means solar. And around the early 70s, this was generally accepted uh, as a black hole because uh, this dark compact object puts off no light and is too heavy to be a neutron star or another compact object. So it's most likely a black hole. And that brings us to our first method. How do we see a black hole? We put it near a star. And Ali is going to tell us more about that. So, um, Ronan talked a lot about black holes themselves. Now I'm going to go more in depth into actually how do we see the black hole, the question that hopefully people came here with today. And the first method will be putting it near a star. So one consequence of putting it near a star or putting it in what we call a binary is something called a tidal disruption event or a TDE because astronomers really like acronyms. So I'll refer to these as tidal disruption events or TDEs. Um, so what is a tidal disruption event? Well, to understand what it is, I first need to define something called the tidal radius. That's labeled in that diagram as that little r sub t. So the tidal radius is the distance from the black hole where the black hole's gravity will have an effect on an object, but not completely suck it in. So Ronan talked about that Schwarzschild radius where anything that comes within that distance will never be seen again. 
Um, the tidal radius is outside of that, so the black hole will affect it, but not um, suck it in completely. So when an object like a star enters into the tidal radius of a black hole, um, the gravitational forces of the black hole will overtake the star's gravity, holding it together, and rip the star apart. So when this happens, half of the star remains bound to the black hole, and the other half will escape into space, roughly half and half. Okay, so here is an artistic animation of a tidal disruption event to give you a better picture. So you can see the star coming in from the upper left, close to the black hole. Eventually it gets ripped apart, and then half of it comes back, and the other half shoots off somewhere. Um, I want to emphasize that this is an artistic animation, not something that we would see if we look up into the sky right now. Okay, so tidal disruption events are a fairly new area of study. There's a lot of active research going on about them right now. If you recognize that name, it's because it's mine. Alexander Spalding. Um, these are my focus for my PhD dissertation. So I'm super excited that I can actually talk about them in a coffee shop talk today. Um, so like I said, they're a super active area of research, fairly new. The closest detected TDE so far is in the constellation Virgo, which is 65 million light years away. Um, that means that it would take us 65 million years to get to this constellation if we were traveling as fast as light. So since the first TDE was detected in 1990, there have only been fewer than 100 that have been detected total. However, the theoretical event rate for these TDEs is closer to one every 10,000 years. That might not seem like a lot to us, but if you think about the universe being over 10 billion years old, that means that there could be more than 100,000 TDEs out there. That could be a great probe for us into black holes. Um, most that have been detected so far are of a sun-type star and a black hole that's a million times the mass of our sun. So this is a supermassive black hole that Ronan introduced. Um, when these happen, they give off light that's over a billion times brighter than our sun. So that's why we're able to see them at such high distances. Okay, so what happens to a star during a tidal disruption event is something you might have heard of if you've ever asked your astrophysicist friend, what happens if I get too close to a black hole? I have been asked this before. And that's called spaghettification. Um, so let's say we take someone who we know likes black holes for his child, and we put him close to a black hole. Basically, he will spontaneously turn into a bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Obviously, that's not what happens. That's not what spaghettification means. Mathematically, spaghettification looks something like this. Um, what this is saying is that the force of gravity acting from the black hole will be stronger on the side of the object that's closer to the black hole and weaker on the other side. So when this happens, that object will stretch, maybe eventually looking like a spaghetti noodle, and that's where the term spaghettification came in. Okay, so if you're an astronaut, it might look something like this if you're close to a black hole. This is the same type of thing that happens to a star during a tidal disruption event. Um, another way to think about it is it's the same force that acts on our Earth to create the tides from the moon. So when the moon is closer to one side of the Earth, we'll have high tide because the moon's gravitational pull is pulling in that direction. Same thing um, during a TDE, except a black hole's gravity is a lot more is a lot stronger than the moon. Okay, so if we watch this animation one more time and pay close attention to the star in the left, you can see that tidal effect of it stretching, eventually not being able to hold together and ripping apart. Okay, so now we know what a tidal disruption event is. How do we actually see these events happen? Well, there are a couple ways. First is through that unbound material that flies off into space somewhere, right there. Um, the second is through the accretion of the bound material around the black hole. And the third could be from a jet that shoots out of the black hole. Um, these are just a couple ways that I'll go into. 
So now our star is completely disrupted. So our black hole is not a star anymore, but instead of that material. So let's put this gas near a black hole and hopefully we can detect it that way as well. So the first method I talked about in a TDE is through that unbound material. Um, what happens is as the unbound material travels through space, it'll run into other material in space, and this will create shocks. So when, when these shocks happen, um, they produce observable radio emission called synchrotron emission. So if you've never heard of synchrotron emission, basically it happens when you have charged particles moving through a magnetic field, such as electrons, and they're moving close to the speed of light. So what happens is when they move around that magnetic field, they'll continue to change direction and move in a circle, and therefore they're accelerating. And when they're accelerating, they're emitting light or photons, um, basically just light at certain wavelengths. And that's what we can detect from this unbound material. To do that, we have radio dishes on Earth, such as the VLA in New Mexico, which is an array of radio dishes that have detected radio emission from several TDEs so far. So this is the first method that we can detect a TDE and therefore a black hole. Okay, the second is through accretion. So in a tidal disruption event, you saw that some of the material from the star falls back on the black hole and is accreted around it. Um, however, any material that comes close enough to a black hole that comes within that tidal radius can be stuck in that accretion disk. So an accretion disk can form not just from a tidal disruption event, but that's one way um, that they can form. So what happens in an accretion disk is as these particles are traveling around, they're getting closer and closer to the black hole, and therefore they're speeding up because of the conservation of angular momentum. So this is the same thing as if you picture a figure skater spinning, when they pull their arms in closer, they speed up, right? So same thing for these particles in the accretion disk, as they get closer to the center, they'll speed up, um, and this makes collisions occur more frequently due to the higher density of particles, and then they will heat up and release x-rays. Okay, so x-ray emission from all this stuff happening gives us that detection of an accretion disk. And on the left here, I just wanted to point out that Cygnus X1 that Ronan introduced in the x-ray, you can hopefully now see that accretion disk around there. Okay, another word for accretion disks are quasars, which might be a little bit more familiar to you. Um, quasars stand for quasi-stellar radio sources because we're obsessed with acronyms. Um, quasars are that hot, bright material around an accretion disk. They're the brightest objects in the sky, therefore we can see them the farthest back out of anything, and they're the oldest objects that we can study. So they really give us a probe into the early universe. So hypothetically, if we look into the sky, we should be able to see a quasar like that. That would be great. Unfortunately, this is again just an artist's interpretation. Um, instead, our telescopes like Hubble will see images like this of quasars. So the left image here shows two quasars at the center of two merging galaxies. And then on the right, we just have a single quasar. Um, but you can see how bright those are. They're not quite as clear as that picture earlier, but that's okay. Okay, so what do we actually observe from these accretion disks or quasars? Well, the physical temperature of an object determines the wavelength of radiation it emits. So everything with a temperature will be emitting some form of radiation. For example, as humans, we are all in this room right now emitting infrared radiation. If you've ever looked at an um, infrared camera or seen an infrared image, it looks something like this because our temperatures give off that type of radiation. Well, the hotter an object is, the shorter the wavelength becomes. Because accretion disks are so hot, some parts of them are hot enough to emit x-rays, so radiation with very short wavelengths. So this is one way that we can detect an accretion disk. Um, they do emit light anywhere from infrared to x-ray, but x-ray is very clear. And one instrument that we use to detect these is Chandra in space. So Ronan mentioned that x-ray telescopes have to be above Earth's atmosphere, and that's because our atmosphere will block all x-ray radiation, luckily for us. 
Okay, the third way um, that we could detect tidal disruption event in or a black hole is through black hole jets. So you can see in this animation that black holes are really known for sucking in matter and light, right? We, we really picture them as small and light and matter. However, they also shoot off um, light and matter in both directions in these jets. Um, these jets can go distances of thousands of light years, so they can be seen across the universe. So where do these jets come from? Short answer, we don't really know yet. Um, if you have any ideas, let me know. This is still a super active area of research, so there's not one theory that will tell us exactly why these jets happen. However, we know that we can detect them, so they're a great probe into black holes. Of course, we have a couple theories. We don't just leave it at that. Um, the first is that they come from tidal disruption events. And the reason that this is a theory is because for several detected TDEs, we have also observed these jets. However, we don't really know the physics for why these jets will happen during a TDE. So maybe the main theory is that these jets come from the black hole rotation itself. So when the black hole is rotating, and in that accretion disk, we have rotation of charged particles. This will create a magnetic field. And the idea for this is the magnetic field will cause um, material to accelerate outwards into those jets. But again, still a very active area of research. Um, but these jets are really powerful, so they are a way that we could detect black holes. All right, so we get some measurement in Chandra, um, in the VLA. How do we know that it's a tidal disruption event, an accretion disk, a jet? How do we know what we're looking at? Well, the first thing that we do is we start with a mathematical model. For example, Newton told us a while ago that if we use the equation y equals one half gt squared, we can say exactly how much time it will take for that panda to fall from the tree. In astrophysics, a lot of times, this model includes an equation for gravity, such as our force equation here, which basically tells us that the closest we, closer we get to an object, the stronger the gravitational pull will be. Sometimes you can stop here. If you have a really good mathematical model, you can calculate exactly what the emission from an astrophysical event would look like. However, these models can get really complicated. Um, so one helpful tool that we have are computer simulations using these models um, of different astrophysical events. So this is actually one of my simulations of a tidal disruption event. And the idea is to take the output data from these simulations and compare it to observational data so that hopefully we can match things up and characterize what is exactly happening. All right, so my password. Okay, I'll turn this on and hopefully. Hello? Test. Oh, okay. Hear me. Okay, so um, in the next part of this talk, we're going to go into a few different ways that we can um, point telescopes at black holes and try to learn more about them. Now, of course, we, if we point a telescope at a black hole, we can't actually see it, uh, but we can see what it's doing to the stuff around it. And one of these um, collaborations that looks at studying black holes is called the Event Horizon Telescope uh, Collaboration. And you might have heard in the news a few, or a few years ago that scientists were able to uh, take a picture of the event horizon of a black hole. The way that they were able to do this is they were able to take a whole lot of telescopes all over the world, you can see pictures of them all over here, and turn them into one giant telescope. The reason they did this is because in order to be able to see any detail about the event horizon of a black hole, we have to have really, really high um, resolution. Resolution being, if I pointed a telescope at two objects, what the closest they can be together and still be resolved as two objects. And for the event horizon telescope, their angular resolution was about 35 micro arc seconds which means effectively that if you were standing in New York, you would, able, you would be able to uh, read the data from a point in Los Angeles. So really, really powerful angular res resolution to, to be able to take images of the event horizon. 
So the first image that was released by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration was of M87, which is uh, a supermassive black hole in the Virgo cluster. Uh, this is a picture, uh, image of the Virgo cluster, and this is where uh, M87 is. That's about 15 million light years away. It's about six, uh, the, um, uh, the supermassive black hole is about six billion times the mass of our sun, or six billion solar masses, as Ryan mentioned uh, in his part of the talk. Uh, one thing that they were able to observe is this sort of crescent. So the circle in the middle represents the width of the event horizon, which did match what um, general relativity predicted to be for a supermassive black hole of this size. Uh, and another thing that they noticed was this sort of crescent of brighter um, emission, and that was caused by turbulence of the uh, material in the black hole's accretion disk. And what that's caused, caused by is the black hole spinning, its tilt, and also the effect of its magnetic field. Another image that they took a little bit more recently was of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, which is Sagittarius A. Uh, Sagittari or sorry, Sagittarius A star. It's about um, 27,000 light years away, and it's about 4 million times the mass of our sun. And one thing that you'll notice is that instead of one crescent of brighter emission, it has three brighter bits. Uh, the reason for that is because what we're looking at here is actually an averaged image um, rather than uh, with M85, which was sorry, with, with M85, because it's such a, a much more massive black hole than um, Sagittarius A star, all of its images look kind of the same. But for um, Sagittarius A star, all the material around it is orbiting it so fast that that crescent changes position really, really fast to the point that we're not quite able to capture it very well at one particular spot. So we would create an average image which has these three bright spots. Okay, so we've talked about putting black holes near gas. Now we're going to talk about putting things behind a black hole. And we're gonna do that first by talking about something called lensing. Now normally when you think of a lens, you might think of say the lens in your eye, the lens in a camera, the lens in your glasses. But generally speaking, a lens is any material that's able to um, distort or concentrate light. In this little diagram, we have a source that's emitting some light, and that light gets bent by the lens uh, to the point that when the observer looks at it, it changes the trajectory, so it kind of looks like the light came from these two different sort from sorry these two different points instead of the source. So when we're talking about um, um, lensing in astrophysics. Uh, we talk about gravitational lensing, which instead of some material bending the light, it's the force of gravity. Uh, so in this, uh, sorry, in this illustration, we have, say, an observer on Earth that is trying to look at this quasar that is behind this galaxy. Now, in order, to, now as the light goes away from the quasar, it gets bent by the force of gravity from this galaxy, and from our vantage point. It looks like the light is coming from several different directions other than where it actually came from. Now, instead of having a galaxy as your lens, let's imagine that we have a black hole as your lens. Um, so the way that black holes distort what we see is that they have, um, just like a galaxy, where they have incredibly powerful gravitational fields so that when light is traveling near them, not quite near enough to get um, uh, to pass into its event horizon, but close enough that the force of its gravity is able to bend the light, change what direction it travels, distort it, and then by the time we see it through our telescope, it gets distorted and it also looks like it's coming from a different angle. Over on the right side, we have an artist's representation of what a black hole would look like if it was passing in front of a galaxy. You can see it kind of looks like a uh, a funhouse mirror that you might see at a carnival. It makes everything look a little bit uh, distorted and weird. You don't quite get the clean image that you see once it's past it. So we're actually look. So these are both artist representations. But if we look at actual images, you see this. So over on the right, or, or, sorry, your left. Um, what we have here is a deep field image, um, which is basically, you, we take a telescope, in this case it was the JWST telescope, we point it at a point in the sky for a very long time and we try to get as much light as possible. 
Uh, one thing that you see is like is all of these little uh, lensing arcs, which are basically light getting distorted. That's how we know that something has been lensed, because if it hasn't been lensed, it will just appear as a point, kind of like these bright spots. Um, in this case, uh, the image is getting lensed by a galaxy cluster that's in front of it. So the point sources that you see that are not stretched out or distorted are uh, part of the galaxy cluster. And anything that you see that's kind of like stretched out or distorted uh, or anything in the background. Uh, over on the other side, we have examples of something called Einstein rings. Uh, now, Einstein rings are caused by the alignment of the of the lens and the thing, and the source that you're looking at. So, the more aligned the source and the lens are, the more the increased effect that you'll see of a gravitational wave. To the point that if they're perfectly aligned, they will look almost like a circle. Um, over this one is what we call the horseshoe because it's almost quite a circle, but not quite. Um, that little dot in the middle is the uh, galaxy that's causing the lensing. Uh, this one is actually uh, a galaxy getting lensed by a black hole. And this one, which is not quite a perfect Einstein ring, but I just included it because it looks kind of like a smiley face, is, uh, is uh, the, uh, Cheshire, the Cheshire gal group of galaxies, uh, named so because of the two galaxies here that are um, kind of look like eyes, and then the Einstein ring with the smiley face. Uh, these two galaxies are actually on their way to collide. They're about, they're moving towards each other at about 300,000 miles per hour. Now, they won't collide in any kind of human time scale, but billions of years in the future they will. Okay. So we've talked about putting things behind a black hole. The next thing we're going to talk about are detecting space-time ripples. Now, what do I mean by space-time ripples? Uh, if you remember Ronan's portion of the talk where he talked about uh, matter telling space-time how to curve, uh, gravitational waves are what happen where we have two massive objects that are kind of similar size that are orbiting each other. And what they do is cause this ripple effect where or we have these things called gravitational waves that propagate outward at the speed of light. Um, in this little gif, you can kind of see these two objects pretend they're black holes. And you can see that as they orbit each other, they cause all of this distortion that propagates outward. Now for black holes, there's many different ways that black holes can cause this. You can have supermassive black hole binaries that are orbiting each other, creating relatively low frequency gravitational waves. And by um, frequency, I mean, um, you remember wavelength is the distance from peak to peak of a wave. Frequency is the amount of waves that pass by in a second. And then higher frequency black holes can be caused by uh, stellar mass black hole mergers. Uh, this is an artist representation. You can kind of see the little black hole uh, orbiting the larger one and eventually getting sucked in and making a single black hole. And then those little distortions all around just show the gravitational waves getting um, Okay, so one way that we are able to detect gravitational waves is with laser interferometry. Laser interferometry. Uh, the LIGO collaboration um, is a collaboration that is able to that uh, uses laser interferometry to detect gravitational waves. And the way that it does that is if you see in this little GIF, we have two arms where we have a laser that's getting shot out from here. It's getting split into two beams. It gets reflected off of mirrors and then comes back. So when a gravitational wave passes through those lasers, it's going to change the shape, or ch sorry, change the uh, width of the lasers just a little bit to cause an interference pattern when they combine. And that interference pattern, that which will show up over here, will tell us that a gravitational wave has passed by. Over on uh, the side, oh, sorry, over on the left, uh, this is a GIF showing uh, what the uh, data from the gravitational wave detector looks like as the merger is happening. You can see that these wiggles get stronger and stronger until they get really strong and stop. And that helps you that a merger is happening. Uh, these are pictures of two uh, interferometers that are in the U.S. Uh, I go Livingston and Hanford. Livingston is in Louisiana and Hanford is in Washington. There are also uh, ones on uh, sorry. There are also a few other detectors, but I just I focus on the ones that are in the US. 
Okay, so in the future, there are a lot of different ways that we can detect not just the gravitational waves that LIGO can see, but others. Uh, one is LISA, which is an as yet to be made um, interferometer that will be in space. There's also the Einstein telescope, which will be an interferometer that will be um, underground. Uh, the next generation event horizon telescope, which is kind of like what I showed you, but just add a lot more dishes, so we have much better uh, resolving power. And another way is also through uh, pulsar timing arrays, which hopefully will be able to detect um, gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries. Okay. That's the end of our talk. Uh, please join us next for our next talk, which will be the lifespan of stars. Well, um, I think I'm the only one who actually does observing in my research. Um, but uh, yeah, so I actually do research on pulsars, which is the last thing I mentioned. And uh, yeah, I do get to sometimes go to telescope sites to do observing. So there's an idea of uh, primordial black holes that are black holes that are created at the beginning of the universe, um, and they are another open question in uh, Castro and uh, let us know. But it is possible that we don't see them because they've already evaporated. And we won't see Hawking radiation. Uh, the, the question is, what does the tidal radius depend on? It depends on the mass of the black hole. So a larger black hole will have a larger tidal radius? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, is it slowly pulling in the matter of 
all of the stars in the galaxy? Or is it, are we just simply rotating around? So the question is, Sagittarius A star at the center of our galaxy, is it pulling everything in or are we just rotating around it? Um, and the answer is we're rotating around it. So Ali kind of touched on this conservation of angular momentum. Uh, because we're moving relative to it, uh, we're going to stay on this kind of rotational plane outside of it. Okay, so the question is basically where is Cygnus uh, in relationship to us and to Sagittarius A star? I don't remember. <laughs> um, it, it is outside of that, I'd say that for sure. Is the question like it's not a star? It's the Cygnus is a black hole in a star of mine. Yes. Uh, so Cygnus uh, X one is a system of two objects: a supermassive um, blue star and a uh, black hole about twenty two times the mass of our sun. There's a new telescope that around the around the Earth. Has that increased the detection of black holes? With the increased resolution it has, with the Hubble telescope or anything like that? Did you Yeah. Okay, um, so, okay, so the question is, uh, can we, uh, we recently put up a new telescope, scientists recently put up a new telescope called JWST. Uh, how does that affect uh, our ability to see black holes? Mm -hmm. Um, well, Lensing, yeah. Uh, so yeah, back in uh, my lensing slide, uh, the image that I showed you was from uh, JWST, and uh, what we're able to do with that telescope is, uh, for deep field images especially, we can see more evidence of uh, galaxies that are really, really far away from us getting lensed by galaxy clusters that are from us, or that are in between us and background galaxies. So the, I think your question is, uh, how, on what time scale can a black hole change what we see from the start? Yeah, as it passes across it. Passes it. Uh, so, we wouldn't expect a black hole to necessarily pass in front of an object in a human time scale. Um, the uh, sort of image that I showed earlier, uh, I can go back to it. Okay, well, I can't. Um, uh, so the image that I showed earlier of a black hole passing in front of a galaxy, that was uh, that was an artist interpretation, well, sorry, a computer simulation plus an artist interpretation, uh, just to give an idea of how it can change what you see, uh, but that's not something we would expect to see in real life. Yeah. So it doesn't need to move for us to see a lensing if there's a stationary but relatively stationary black hole in front of something else, we'll still see it lens. Uh, its mass alone is enough to distort the lens. It doesn't need to be moving the lens. It's just a nice illustration of the lens. Okay, so the particles that fly around the that you're doing events, yeah. is that all, all on one plane or is it completely like around the, the same? It's on one plane. Okay. Do you know why that is? Why it goes on one plane as opposed to entirely around the, the um, 
Yeah, conservation of angular momentum um, would be the same. <laughs> <laughs>